Chapter 10 For 15 years, Homer Wells had taken responsibility for the writing of the Cider House Rules. Every year, it was the last thing he attached to the wall after the fresh coat of paint had dried. Some years he wrote funny rules, other years he wrote in a neutral tone, perhaps it had been Olive's tone and not the rules themselves that had caused some offense. The rules did not change much. And the migrants still sat on the roof and drank too much and fell off, and Homer Wells still asked or told them not to. Rules, he guessed, never asked, rules told. But he tried to make the cider house rules seem friendly. He phrased the rules in a confiding voice. There have been some accidents on the roof, over the years, especially at night, and especially in combination with having a great deal to drink while sitting on the roof. We recommend that you do your drinking with both feet on the ground, Homer wrote. But every year, the piece of paper itself became worn and used for other things. A kind of grocery list, for example. Every summer Mr. Rose wrote to Wally and Wally told Mr. Rose how many pickers he needed, and Mr. Rose wrote the day when they arrived. No contract ever existed, just the short, reliable assurances from Mr. Rose. Some summers he came with a woman, large and soft and quiet, with a baby girl. By the time when the little girl could run around and get into trouble, she was about the age of Angel Wells, Mr. Rose stopped bringing her or the woman. Every year when the woman and the daughter didn't come, Homer Wells always asked Mr. Rose, How's your little girl? She is growing, like your boy, Mr. Rose always answered. And how's your lady? Homer asked. She's looking after the little girl, Mr. Rose said. Only once in 15 years Homer Wells talked to Mr. Rose about the Cider House rules. I hope they don't offend anyone, Homer began, I'm responsible, I write them, every year, and if anyone takes offense, I hope you'll tell me. No offense, said Mr. Rose, smiling. They're just little rules, Homer said. Yes, said Mr. Rose. They are. But it really concerns me that no one pays attention to them, Homer finally said. Mr. Rose, whose face was unchanged by the years and whose body had remained thin and lithe looked at Homer mildly. We got our own rules, too, Homer, he said. Your own rules, said Homer Wells. About lots of things, said Mr. Rose. About how we can behave with you, for example. With me? Homer said. With white people, said Mr. Rose. We have our rules about that. I see, Homer said, but he didn't really see. And about fighting, said Mr. Rose. Fighting, said Homer Wells. With each other 
said Mr. Rose. One rule is that we can't cut each other badly. Not for hospital, not for police. We can cut each other, but not badly. I see, Homer said. No, you don't, said Mr. Rose. You don't see, that's the point. We can cut each other only so badly that you never see, you never know we were cut. You see? Right, said Homer Wells. Can you say something else? Mr. Rose asked, smiling. Just be careful on the roof, Homer advised him. Nothing too bad can happen up there, Mr. Rose told him. Worse things can happen on the ground. Homer Wells was going to say right, again, when he discovered that he couldn't talk. Mr. Rose had seized his tongue between his index finger and his thumb. A vague taste, like dust, was in Homer's mouth, Mr. Rose's hand had been so fast, Homer had never seen it, he never knew before that someone could actually catch hold of someone's tongue. I've caught you, said Mr. Rose. Smiling, he let Homer's tongue go. Homer managed to say, You're very fast. Right, said Mr. Rose. There's no one faster. Wally complained to Homer about the yearly damage of the cider house roof. Every two or three years. They had to retain the roof. They have their own rules, but why can't they pay attention to ours? Wally asked Homer. I don't know, Homer said. Write him a letter and ask him. But no one wanted to offend Mr. Rose, he was a reliable crew boss. He made the picking and the pressing go well every harvest. Candy, who managed the money at Ocean View, claimed that all the expenses for repairs to the cider house roof were more than compensated by Mr. Rose's reliability. He does a good job, Candy said. Let him have his own rules. Homer Wells looked away, he knew that rules, for candy, were all private contracts. Fifteen years ago, they had made their own rules, or, really, candy had made them before Wally came home. They stood in the cider house after Angel was born, on a night when Olive was looking after Angel. They had just made love, but not happily, something was wrong. That night Candy had said, let's agree to something. Okay, Homer said. Whatever happens, we share Angel. Of course, Homer said. I mean... You will always get all the father time you want to have, and I will always get all the mother time I need, Candy said. Always, said Homer Wells, but something was wrong. I mean, regardless of what happens, whether I'm with you, or with Wally, Candy said. Homer was quiet for a while. So you're leaning toward Wally? He asked. I'm not leaning anywhere, Candy said. 
I'm standing right here, and we're agreeing to certain rules. I didn't know that they were rules, said Homer Wells. We share Angel, Candy said. We both should live with him. We are his family. Nobody ever moves out. Even if you're with Wally? Homer said, after a while. Remember what you told me when you wanted me to have Angel? Candy asked him. Homer Wells was cautious, now. Remind me, he said. You said that he was your baby, too, that he was ours. That I couldn't decide, all by myself, not to have him, that was the point, Candy said. Yes, Homer said. I remember. Well, if he was ours then, he's ours now, whatever happens. Candy repeated. In the same house? Asked Homer Wells. Even if you go with Wally? Like a family, Candy said. Like a family, said Homer Wells. It was a word that gripped him. An orphan is a child, forever. An orphan detests change, an orphan hates to move, an orphan loves routine. For fifteen years, Homer Wells knew that there were possibly as many cider house rules as there were people who had passed through the cider house. Even so, every year, he posted a fresh list. For fifteen years, the Board of Trustees had tried and failed to replace Dr. Large. They couldn't find anyone who wanted the job. There were people dying to throw themselves into unrewarded service, but there were more exotic places than street clouds where their services were needed, and where they could also suffer. The Board of Trustees couldn't manage to tempt a new nurse into service there, either, they couldn't hire even an administrative assistant. Then, all of a sudden, a new nurse came to Street Clouds. Nurse Carolyn, they called her, she was constantly of use. Homer Wells had sent her from the hospital in Cape Kenneth. Homer Wells knew that Nurse Carolyn believed in the Lord's work, and he had persuaded her to go where her devotion would be welcome. Nurse Carolyn was really like an angel. Larch had trouble with the word angel since Homer Wells and Candy had taken their son away from street clouds. Larch had trouble with the whole idea of how Homer was living. For fifteen years, Wilbur Larch had been amazed that the three of them, Homer and Candy and Wally, had managed it. He wasn't at all sure what they had managed, or at what cost. He knew, of course, that Angel was a wanted child, and well loved. But how had they arranged their life together? Larch looked out the window at the apple orchard on the hill. That summer of 195, the trees were thriving, the apples were mostly pale green and pink, the leaves were of dark green color. The trees were almost too tall for Nurse Edna to spray with the Indian pump. I should ask Nurse Carolyn to take care of them, 
Dr. Large thought. He wrote a note to himself and left it in the typewriter. The heat made him sleepy. He went to the dispensary and stretched himself out on the bed. In the summer, with the windows open, he could risk a slightly heavier dose of ether, he thought. The last summer that Mr. Rose was in charge of the picking crew at Ocean View was the summer of 195, when Angel Wells was 15. All that summer, Angel had been looking forward to the next summer, when he would be 16, old enough to have his driver's license. He hoped to save enough money, from his summer jobs in the orchards and from his contribution to the harvests, to buy his first car. His father, Homer Wells, didn't own a car. When Homer went shopping in town or when he worked at the hospital in Cape Kenneth, he used one of the farm vehicles. The old Cadillac, which had been equipped with a hand-operated brake and accelerator so Wally could drive it, was often available. Candy had her own car, a yellow Jeep in which she had taught Angel to drive. I taught your father how to swim, Candy told Angel. I guess I can teach you how to drive. Of course, Angel knew how to drive all the farm vehicles, too. He knew how to mow, and how to spray. The driver's license was simply necessary, official approval of something Angel already did very well on the farm. And, for a 15-year-old, he looked much older. He was going to be taller than his boyish, round-faced father they were of the same height as the summer began. Even the trace of a beard was on Angel's face. The shadows under his eyes were not unhealthy looking, they only accented the vivid darkness of his eyes. It was a joke between father and son, that the shadows under Angel's eyes were inherited. You get your insomnia from me. Homer Wells often told his son, who still thought he was adopted. You've got no reason to feel adopted, his father had told him. You've got three parents, really. Candy had been like a mother to him, and Wally was a second father, or the favorite, eccentric uncle. The only life Angel had known was a life with all of them. At fifteen, he'd never suffered so much as a change of rooms, everything had been the same since he could remember it. He had the room, which Wally had shared with Homer. Angel had been born into a real boy's room. He'd grown up surrounded by Wally's tennis and swimming trophies, and the pictures of Candy with Wally when Wally's legs worked, and even the picture of Candy teaching Homer how to swim. Homer's room down the hall had been Olive's room and the room where Senior had died. Olive herself had died in Cape Kenneth Hospital before the war was over, even before they'd sent Wally home. It was an inoperable cancer, which spread very quickly. Homer and Candy and Ray had taken turns visiting her, one of them was always with Angel but Olive was never alone. Because of Wally's state, they decided not to tell Wally of Olive's cancer, 
That was how Olive had wanted it, too. In the end, Olive thought that Wally had come home. She was pumped so full of painkillers that she mistook Homer for Wally in their last few meetings. Homer had often read to her, from Jane Eyre, from David Copperfield, and from Great Expectations, but he gave that up when Olive's attention began to wander. The first few times Olive confused Homer with Wally, Homer couldn't be sure whom she thought she was addressing. You must forgive him, Olive said. Her speech was unclear. She took Homer's hand. Forgive him? said Homer Wells. Yes, Olive said. He loves her very much, and he needs her very much. To Candy, Olive was clearer. She said. He's going to be crippled. And he's going to lose me. If he loses you, too, who's going to look after him? I'll always look after him, Candy said. Homer and I will look after him. It's not right to hurt or deceive someone who's already been hurt and deceived. Candy, Olive said. With the drugs, she was taking Olive felt a perfect freedom. It was not for her to tell them that she knew what she knew, it was for them to tell her what they were keeping from her. Until they told her, she could keep them guessing about what she knew. To Homer, Olive said. He's an orphan. Who is? Homer asked. He is, she said. Don't forget how needy an orphan is. He'll take everything. He has come from having nothing, when he sees what he can have, he'll take everything that he sees. My son, Olive said, don't blame anyone. Blame will kill you. Yes, said Homer Wells, who held Olive's hand. When he bent over her, to hear how she was breathing, she kissed him. Blame will kill you, he repeated to Candy, after Olive had died. He's coming home. And he doesn't even know his mother's dead, Candy said, then she stopped talking. Candy and Wally were married less than a month after Wally returned to Ocean View. Wally weighed 147 pounds, and Homer Wells pushed the wheelchair down the church aisle. Candy and Wally occupied the converted bedroom on the ground floor of the big house. Homer Wells had written to Wilbur Larch, shortly after Wally had come home, Olive's death had fixed things for Candy and Wally more strongly than Wally's paralysis, or than any sense of betrayal and guilt. Candy's right. Don't worry about Angel, Wilbur Larch had written to Homer Wells. Angel will get enough love. He won't feel like an orphan. If you're a good father to him, and Candy's a good mother to him, and if he's got Wally who loves him, too, do you think he's going to start missing his so-called real father? The problem won't be Angel's problem. It will be yours. You will want him to know you're his real father, because of you, 
not because he will need to know. The problem is that you will need to tell. You and Candy. You will be proud. It will be for you, and not for Angel, that you will want to tell him that he's no orphan. And to himself, or as an entry in a brief history of street clouds, Wilbur Larch wrote, Here in street clouds we have just one problem. His name is Homer Wells. He's a problem, wherever he goes. Aside from the darkness in his eyes and a far away look, Angel Wells resembled his father very little. He never thought of himself as an orphan, he knew he had been adopted, and he knew he came from where his father came from. And he knew he was loved, he had always felt it. He called Candy Candy, Homer Dad and Wally Wally. This was the second summer that Angel Wells had been strong enough to carry Wally, up some steps, or into the surf, or out of the shallow end of the pool and back into the wheelchair. Homer had taught Angel how to carry Wally into the surf, when they went to the beach. Wally was a better swimmer than any of them, but he needed to get into deep water. There were some rules regarding Wally there were always rules, Angel had observed. Wally was never allowed to swim alone. And Angel Wells was Wally's lifeguard when Wally swam. And Wally was not allowed to drive alone, even though the cattle I cut hand operated controls, someone else had to put the wheelchair in or take it out of the back of the car. So Angel had often been the passenger in the Cadillac and Wally had taught Angel to drive the Cadillac. When the time came, it never occurred to Candy that Angel had been so easy to teach because he'd been driving the Cadillac for years. Some rules are good rules, kiddo, Wally often told the boy kissing him which Wally did a lot. But some rules are just rules. You just have to break them carefully. It's dumb that I have to be 16 before I get a driver's license, Angel told his father. Right, said Homer Wells. They should make an exception for kids who grow up on farms. Sometimes Angel played tennis with Candy, but more often, he hit balls back to Wally, who maintained his good strokes even sitting down. It's actually better practice for you than for me, kiddo, Wally often told Angel. At least, I'm not getting any better. Angel got a lot better, he was so much better than Candy that it sometimes hurt his mother's feelings when she saw how boring it was for Angel to play with her. Homer Wells didn't play tennis. And Homer Wells had no hobbies, he just followed his son like a oil dog. Angel and Homer had pillow fights in the dark, they kissed each other good night, and then found excuses to repeat the ritual, and found new ways to wake each other in the mornings. Homer had continued his volunteer work for Cape Kenneth Hospital, in a sense, he had never stopped his war effort, his service as a nurse's aide. And he was an experienced reader of medical literature. 
the Journal of the American Medical Association and the New England Journal of Medicine were piled up on the tables and in the bookcases of the Ocean View House. Candy objected to the illustrations in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. I need a little intellectual stimulation around here, Homer Wells said when Candy complained about the graphic nature of this material. I just don't think that Angel has to see it, Candy said. He knows that I am interested in medicine, Homer said. But I object to the pictures, Candy said. There's no reason to mystify the subject for the child, Wally said, taking Homer's side. There's no need to make the subject grotesque, either, Candy argued. I don't think it's either a mystery or grotesque, Angel said, that summer he was 15. It's just interesting. You're not even going out with girls, yet, Candy said, laughing, and taking the opportunity to kiss him. But when she bent over him to kiss him, she saw in her son's lap the illustration from an article on vaginal operations. Homer Candy shouted. Homer was upstairs in his bedroom. The interior was very simple. By his bed, he had a picture of Wally in his uniform where Wally was posing with the crew of Opportunity Knox. And in the bathroom Homer had tacked up the blank questionnaire, the extra copy the one he'd never sent to the Board of Trustees of Street Clouds. The paper was old but each question had remained readable and idiotic. Candy called to him. Please come and see what your son is reading. That was the way they all talked. Candy said your son to Homer. And that's how Wally spoke, too, and Angel always said Dad or Pop when he addressed his father. It had been an uninterrupted, 15-year relationship Homer and Angel upstairs, Wally and Candy in the former dining room downstairs. The four of them ate their meals together. We are a family. Isn't that the main thing? Candy used to ask Homer Wells. Angel has a family, a really wonderful family. Yes, that's the main thing, Homer agreed. Sometimes Wally told Candy how happy he was. Those were the nights when Candy couldn't sleep thinking of Homer Wells, who was awake, too. Some nights they met in the kitchen and had some milk and apple pie. Some nights, when it was warm, they sat by the swimming pool not touching each other. The way they sat by the pool reminded them both of how they used to sit on Ray Kendall's dock, before they'd sat closer together. Raymond Kendall had died shortly after Wally and Candy were married. He was killed when the lobster pound blew up, his whole dock was blown apart, and his lobster boat sank and two old heaps of automobiles were destroyed. Ray was doing something with his torpedo when it exploded. Ray's death brought out the guilt in Candy, she regretted that she'd not told her father about Homer and Angel Wells. 
She thought that Ray already knew everything but she also felt that he wanted to hear it from her. In 195, Wilbur Larch was 90-something. Sometimes his face held so still under the ether cone that the mask stayed in place after his hand had dropped to his side, only the force of his exhalations made the cone fall. He had lost a lot of weight. In a mirror, or traveling with his beloved ether, he had the impression that he was becoming a bird. That summer, Mr. Rose wrote that he and the daughter might arrive a day or so ahead of the picking crew, he hoped that the cider house would be ready. It's been a long time since we've seen the daughter, Wally remarked, in the Apple Mart office. Everett Taft was outside, oiling Wally's wheelchair for him, so Wally was sitting on the desk, his thin legs were swinging limply. Candy was playing with the adding machine. I think the daughter is about Angel's age, she said. Right, said Homer Wells, and Wally suddenly hit Homer. Because Homer had been leaning on the desk and Wally had been sitting up straight, the strike caught Homer completely by surprise and he fell on the floor. Wally Candy said. I'm so sick of it. Wally shouted. Can't you learn a new word, Homer? Wally said. Jesus, Wally, Candy said. I'm okay, Homer said, but he remained sitting on the office floor. I'm sorry, Wally said. It just gets on my nerves, you're right all the time. I'm sorry, buddy, Wally said and put his head on Homer's shoulder. Homer did not say right. Candy went to get a piece of ice and a towel for Homer's face, and Homer said, It's okay. Wally. Everything's okay. For fifteen years, Candy and Homer thought that Wally knew everything, that he accepted everything, but that he didn't like their fear to tell the truth. At the same time, Homer and Candy imagined that it was a relief to Wally that he didn't have to admit that he knew everything. What new, uncomfortable position could they put him in by telling him now? The main thing was that Angel did not know, not until Candy and Homer told him. The main thing was that Angel shouldn't hear it from anyone else. Whatever Wally knew, he would never tell Angel. If Homer was surprised, he was surprised that Wally had never hit him before. What was that all about? Candy asked Homer when they were alone that night by the swimming pool. I guess it is irritating how I say right all the time, Homer said. Wally knows, Candy said. That's what you've thought for fifteen years, said Homer Wells. Do you think that he doesn't know? Candy asked. I think that he loves you, and you love him, Homer said. I think that he knows we love Angel. I think that Wally loves Angel, too. But do you think he knows that Angel is ours? 
Candy asked. I don't know, Homer said. I know that one day Angel has to know that he's ours. I think that Wally knows I love you, he said. And that I love you? Candy asked. Does he know that? You love me sometimes, Homer said. Not very often. I wasn't talking about sex, Candy whispered. I was, said Homer Wells. They had been extremely careful. Since Wally had come home from the war, Homer and Candy had made love only 270 times, an average of only 18 times a year, only one and a half times a month. Candy said that for Wally's sake and for Angel's they should never be caught. If anyone ever saw them, they would stop, forever. That was why they hadn't told Wally. Wally would accept that they'd thought he was dead and that they had needed each other, and that they'd wanted Angel, too. Who couldn't accept what had happened? What was happening now was what they knew Wally wanted to know, and they couldn't tell him. They had another thing to be careful about. Candy was afraid to become pregnant because Wally already knew that he was sterile. Candy made Homer promise that he would give her an abortion if she got pregnant. She could not fool Wally about another trip to Street Clouds, she did not want to fool him, she said. Homer Wells knew that there was no reason for Candy to get pregnant. But he wrote to Dr. Large to request the proper medical equipment for performing an operation. Dr. Large sent the instruments promptly. For 15 years, Homer had told her, You won't get pregnant. You can't. Do you have everything you need, if you need it? She always asked him. Yes, he said. That July, it was one hot and lazy Saturday afternoon, Homer was swimming in the pool, he had been working in the orchards all morning. Angel had been working with him. And now Angel was out of the pool, he was tossing a baseball back and forth with Wally. Wally was sitting on the lawn, and Angel was standing on the deck. Candy came down to the pool from the Apple Mart office. She was wearing her work clothes, jeans, a shirt, with oversized pockets work boots, a red baseball cap. I know that the men are out of the fields at noon on Saturday, she said with her hands on her hips, but the women are working in the mart until three. Homer stopped swimming, he stood in the pool, looking at Candy. Wally looked over his shoulder at her. And then he threw the ball to Angel, who threw it back. Please hold the ball, while I'm trying to say something, Candy said. Wally held the ball. What are you trying to say? He asked. I think that on Saturdays, as long as there are people working at the mart, you shouldn't play at the pool, everyone can hear you, and I think it's not good. You play, and they have to work, Candy said. 
Did you see what I mean, Homer? Candy asked him. Homer allowed himself to sink. He held his breath for a while, and when he came up for air, Candy was going through the kitchen door. The door banged. And then, all of a sudden, Homer said it. Homer spat out some water and said to Angel, Go and tell your mother that if she changes her clothes, we'll take her to the beach. Angel was halfway to the house before Homer realized what he'd said, and Wally said to Angel, Tell her to change her mood, too. When Angel was in the kitchen, Wally said, I don't think he even noticed what you said, old boy. It's just that she is such a mother to him, I can't help thinking of her that way, Homer said. I'm sure that it's hard, Wally said, not to think of her any way that you want. What? Homer asked. She certainly is manipulative, isn't she? Wally asked him. Homer put his head under water again, it was a cool place to think. Manipulative? He said, when he surfaced. Well, someone has to know what to do, Wally, said. Someone has to make the decisions. When Angel and Candy came out of the house, they were ready to go to the beach. Homer watched his son closely, to see if Angel had noticed that Homer had referred to Candy as your mother. There were no changes in Angel's face, and Homer couldn't tell if Angel had heard the slip. Homer didn't know if he should tell Candy that Wally had heard it. They took Candy's jeep. Candy was behind the wheel. All the way to the beach, Wally was just looking out the window intently. That was the first time when Homer knew for certain that Candy was right. He knows. Homer thought. Wally knows. Once, that summer, returning from the beach, they had stopped the car at the playground of the elementary school in Hearts Haven. Wally and Angel wanted to play. Angel was very nimble, and Wally's arms were well developed. They were hooting like monkeys at Homer and Candy, who waited in the car. Our two children, Homer had said to the love of his life. Yes, our family, Candy had said, smiling, watching Wally and Angel climb and swing, climb and swing. It's better for them than watching television said Homer Wells, who always thought of Wally and Angel as children. Homer and Candy shared the opinion that Wally watched too much television, which was a bad influence on Angel, who liked to watch it with him. Wally was so fond of television that he had even given a TV to Homer to take to Street Clouds. Every Christmas, Homer Wells took Angel to Street Clouds. But Wilbur Large didn't like television and finally, they gave the TV away. Nurse Edna and Mrs. Grogan were becoming addicted to it, and Large considered that it was worse for the orphans than religion. It's better for anyone than either. Wilbur, Nurse Edna complained, 
but Larch was firm. He was the first man in Maine who called that television what it was, an idiot box. But Wally loved to watch it, and Angel watched it with him when Candy and Homer didn't object. For many years, since Melanie left Street Clouds she had been dreaming of Homer Wells. She had found a job at a shipyard. That August of 195, just a few days before the picking crew was expected at Ocean View, Melanie took her vacation. Most of the shipyard workers, even the electricians, took a couple of weeks in the summer and a couple of weeks around Christmas. But Melanie took a whole month during harvest time, it made her feel good to pick apples. She had worked at different apple farms in the summer, and she had always asked about Homer Wells, but in vain. This year, she had decided, she'd try working at Ocean View. She hitchhiked when she traveled, and because she wore only men's work clothes, she looked like a tramp, no one could know that she was a shipyard skilled electrician, with enough money in a savings account to buy a nice house and a couple of cars. When Melanie arrived at the Apple Mart, Big Dot Haft was the first to see her. Wally was in the office, he didn't see Melanie, and she didn't see him. Candy was in the kitchen, talking on the phone. Melanie approached Big Dot Haft because Melanie felt comfortable with big, fat women. Big Dot smiled to see how large Melanie was, the two women liked each other at once. Does a guy named Tomer Wells work here? Melanie asked Big Dot. He does, Big Dot said cheerfully. Are you a friend of Homer's? I used to be, Melanie said. I haven't seen him for a long time, she added. Have you just come to see him? Big Dot asked Melanie. I have actually come for work, Melanie said. I've done a lot of picking. Homer hires the pickers, Big Dot said. I guess you're lucky because you are old friends. Find Homer and tell him there's someone to see him. Big Dot told Vernon who was nearby. Homer's the boss. The boss? Melanie said in surprise. Homer Wells and his son, Angel, were taking their lunch break under one of the old trees in an orchard. They were quiet for a while, and then Homer said, is there anything you'd like to ask me, about anything? Angel gave a short laugh, then he paused. Yes, Angel said to his father. I wonder why you don't have a girlfriend, why you are not even interested. This was not the question Homer had expected. I had a girlfriend, in St. Clouds, Homer said. She was older than me, and at the time, she was stronger than me. He said, laughing. Really? Angel said, he wasn't laughing, he had rolled over on his elbows and was watching his father intently. Well, we weren't very much alike, 
Palmer, said. It was one of those cases when the sex happened before there was a friendship. But there really was no friendship, and, after a short while, there wasn't any more sex, either. After that, I'm not sure what the relationship was. What happened after that? Angel asked. I met Wally and Candy, Homer said carefully. I wanted to marry Candy but she married Wally. She was almost my girlfriend, for about five minutes. That was when Wally was in the war, when we didn't know if he was still alive, Homer said quickly. I've always been so close to Wally and Candy, and then, when I had you, I started to feel that I already had everything I wanted. Angel Wells rolled over on his back. Do you still like Candy? He asked. Are you not interested in anybody else? Well, yes, said Homer Wells. Have you met anybody you're interested in? He asked, hoping to change the subject. There is nobody who'd be interested in me, his son said. I mean, the girls who I think about are all too old to look at me. That will change, Homer said, poking Angel in the ribs, the boy rolled on his side, poking back at his father. Very soon, Homer said, the girls are going to stand in line to look at you. He grabbed Angel and they started wrestling. Wrestling with Angel was one way Homer could keep in close physical contact with the boy. A 15-year-old boy doesn't want his father to kiss and hug him, but wrestling was perfectly respectable, that was still allowed. They were wrestling so hard, and laughing and breathing so heavily, that they did not hear Vernon Lynch approach them. Hey, Homer. Vernon said loudly. I've got a message for you. For me? Said Homer Wells. There's a fat woman who says she knows you. She's at the mart, Vernon said. Homer smiled. He knew several fat women at the mart, he thought that Vernon meant Big Dot Haft or Florence Hyde. I mean a new fat woman, Vernon said. She says she wants to be a picker, and she asked for you. She knows you. Homer got slowly to his feet, he'd rolled over a root of the big tree, and the root had hurt him in the ribs. Also, Angel had stuffed grass down the back of his shirt. Angel said to his father, Oh, a fat woman, huh? I guess you didn't tell me about the fat woman. As Homer unbuttoned his shirt to shake at the grass, Angel poked his father's bare stomach. Then Angel noticed that his father had aged. He was still a slender man, and strong from all the orchard work he'd done but just a bit of belly rolled over the belt of his jeans, and his hair was going gray. There was something grim around the corners of Homer's eyes that Angel had also never noticed before. 
Pop? Angel asked him softly. Who's the woman? But his father was looking at him in a panic. It can't be that girl from Street Clouds, can it? Angel was trying to joke with his father, but Homer didn't speak, he didn't even smile. Homer drove fast. On the way back to the Apple Mart, Homer took the public road instead of winning through the back orchards. The public road was faster, although Homer had told all the drivers to keep off it when they could, to avoid any possible accidents with the beach traffic along that road in the summers. Children are most impressed with the importance of a moment when they see a parent breaking the parent's own rule. Do you think it's her? Angel shouted to his father. You've got to admit, it's a little exciting, the boy added, but Homer looked grim. They drove to the mart. The boy followed his father to the place, where Big Dot and Florence and Irene were surrounding the massive Melanie. It is her, isn't it? Angel whispered to his father. Hello, Melanie, said Homer Wells. There was not a sound in the still, summer air. How are you doing? Homer? Melanie asked him. But although she had waited years to see him, Melanie was looking not at Homer Wells but at Angel. Melanie could not take her eyes off the boy. Homer Wells, a pleasant looking man in his forties, did not remind Melanie of the young boy whom she had known. But Angel struck Melanie with a force quite unexpected by her. Poor Angel felt uneasy, but he was a young gentleman and he smiled at the stranger. There's no doubt about who you are, Melanie said to the boy. You look more like your father than your father. Big Dot and the Apple Mart ladies were listening with great interest. It's nice that you see a resemblance, said Homer Wells, but my son is adopted. Adopted? Melanie said. She was disappointed in her oldest friend, after all these years. He still tried to deceive her. Then Candy noticed that no one was working and approached the small crowd. She stepped between Homer and Angel. She was eating an apple and was a little embarrassed to speak to the stranger. Hi. She managed to say to Melanie, who recognized instantly. In Candy's face, those few parts of Angel she had not discovered in Homer Wells. This is Melanie, Homer said to Candy, who had heard all about Melanie long ago, on the cider house roof. This is Mrs. Worthington, Homer mumbled to Melanie. How do you do? Candy managed to say. Mrs. Worthington? Melanie said, her eyes were darting from Angel to Candy, and from Angel to Homer Wells. At that moment, Wally willed himself out of the office and into the mart. Isn't anybody working today? He asked in his friendly way. When he saw there was a stranger, he was polite. Oh, hello. 
he said. Hi, said Melanie. This is my husband, Candy said. Your husband? Melanie said. This is Mr. Worthington, mumbled Homer Wells. Everybody calls me Wally, Wally said. Melanie and I were in the orphanage together, Homer explained. Really? Wally said enthusiastically. That's great, he said. Let them show you the farm. Show her the house, too, Wally told Homer and started to roll back to the office. It's nice to meet you. He called to Melanie. Please stay for supper. Thank you. Melanie called after Wally. He's the only hero here, Melanie thought, watching the door swing closed behind the wheelchair, she could not control her hands. She wanted to touch Angel, to hug him, she'd wanted to get her hands on Homer Wells for years, but now she didn't know what she wanted to do to him. It was hard for Melanie to recognize that there was no love for her in his eyes, he looked like a trapped animal. No one remembered that Melanie had come, among other reasons, for a job. Angel said, Would you like to see the pool first? Well, I don't swim, Melanie said but it would be nice to see it. She smiled at Homer with such warmth that Homer shivered. I'll show you the house, Candy said, after Angel's shown you the pool. She dropped the uneaten apple, and laughed at herself. Angel poked his father in the back as they were walking toward the house and pool. Angel still thought that this surprise was great and unexpected fun. Homer turned briefly and frowned at his son, which was amusing to Angel. While the boy was showing Melanie the swimming pool, Candy and Homer awaited her arrival in the kitchen. She knows, Homer said to Candy. What? Candy said. What does she know? Melanie knows everything, said Homer Wells, in a trance. How could she? Candy asked him. Did you tell her? Don't be ridiculous, Homer said. She just knows, she always knows. Don't you be ridiculous, Candy said crossly. Wally's a great swimmer, Angel explained to Melanie. You're a good looking guy, Melanie said to Angel. You're better looking than your dad ever was. Angel was embarrassed. He took the temperature of the pool. It's warm, he said. It's too bad that you don't swim. You could stay in the shallow end, or I could teach you how to float. Candy taught my dad how to swim. Incredible, Melanie said. If I fell in. I'm sure you could save me, she said to Angel. I could probably save you, if you were drowning, Angel offered cautiously. Incredible, she repeated, her eyes were trying to take in everything.
Do you want to see the house now? Angel asked her. She was making him nervous. Oh, that's a beautiful place, Melanie told Candy, who showed her the downstairs. Homer showed her the upstairs. In the hallway between Homer's and Angel's rooms, Melanie whispered to him, Boy, you have really done all right for yourself. How did you manage it? You even got a great view. She pointed out, sitting on the master bed and looking out the window. When she asked if she could use the bathroom, Homer went downstairs to have a word with Candy, but Angel was still there and he was still curious. Melanie spent a long time in the bathroom, and Homer Wells was grateful for the time, he needed it, to convince Candy and Angel to go back to work, to leave him alone with Melanie. She wants a job, he told them forcefully. I need to have a little time with her, alone. Mirrors had never been Melanie's friends, but the mirror in Homer's bathroom was especially unkind to her. She looked into the medicine cabinet quickly, for no reason, she dumped some of the pills down the toilet. She began ejecting razor blades from a metal dispenser, she emptied the dispenser before she could make herself stop. She cut her finger trying to pick up one of the blades from the floor. She had her finger in her mouth when she first looked at herself in the mirror. She held the razor blade in her other hand while she reviewed the forty-something years she saw in her face. Oh, she had never been attractive, she had never been nice, but once she had been an efficient weapon, she thought, now she wasn't so sure. After a while, she put the blade down on the edge of the sink and cried. Later, she found a cigarette lighter. She used the lighter to melt the handle of Homer's toothbrush, she sunk the razor blade in the softest part and waited for the handle to harden. When she clutched the brush end in her hand, she had quite a nice little weapon, she thought. Then she saw the 15-year-old questionnaire from the Street Clouds Board of Trustees. The paper was so old, she had to be careful not to tear it. How those questions excited her. She threw the toothbrush with the razor blade in the sink, then she picked it up again, then she put it in the medicine cabinet, then she took it out. Melanie stayed upstairs in the bathroom a long time. When she came downstairs, she found Homer waiting for her in the kitchen, she'd had enough time alone for her disposition to change and rechange, for her to understand her real feelings about Homer and his life. Perhaps she had enjoyed a few minutes of the discomfort she had caused him. But by the time she came downstairs she was no longer enjoying herself and her disappointment in Homer Wells was even deeper than her anger. I thought you'd end up doing something better than having sex with a poor cripple's wife and pretending that your own child isn't your own, Melanie said to Homer Wells. You of all people. You, an orphan, she reminded him. It's not quite like that, 
He started to tell her, but she shook her huge head and looked away from him. I've got eyes, Melanie said. I can see what it's like, it's like shit. It's ordinary, middle class unfaithful life and lying to the kids, Melanie said. Homer Wells had expected to be attacked by her, Melanie was an attacker, but this was not the attack, which he had expected. He had imagined that he would, one day, when he saw her again, be a match for her, but now he knew that he would never be a match for Melanie. Do you think I was always looking for you? only to give you a bad time? Melanie asked him. I didn't know you were looking for me, said Homer Wells. I always thought you'd end up like the old man, said Melanie. Like Larch? Homer said. Of course, like Larch. Melanie snapped at him. I thought you would be the missionary. The do-gooder. I don't see large quite that way, Homer said. Don't be snotty to me. Melanie cried, and her raw face streaked with tears. You're a creep. You couldn't even be real honest with your own kid. Some missionary. Isn't that brave? I call that a creep, Melanie told him. Then she left. She never asked him about the job. He never asked her how her life had been. He went upstairs to the bathroom and threw up, he filled the sink with cold water and soaked his head but it didn't help. 175 pounds of truth had struck him in the face and neck and chest, had constricted his breathing and made him ache. A vomit taste was in his mouth. He tried to brush his teeth but he cut himself in the hand before he saw the blade. He felt nearly paralyzed above the waist. When he reached for the towel by the shower door, he saw what else was wrong, he saw what was missing from the bathroom, the blank questionnaire was gone. Homer Wells imagined how Melanie might answer some of the questions. This new panic momentarily lifted him above his own self-pity. He called the orphanage immediately, and heard Nurse Edna's voice. Oh, Homer. She cried, so glad to hear his voice. This is important, he told her. I saw Melanie. Oh, Melanie. Nurse Edna cried happily. Mrs. Grogan will be thrilled. Melanie has a copy of the questionnaire, Homer said. Please tell Dr. Large. I don't think this is good news. I'm speaking about that old questionnaire from the Board of Trustees. Oh, dear, Nurse Edna said. Of course she might never fill it out, Homer said, but she has it, it says where to send it. And I don't know where she's gone. I don't know where she came from. Was she married? Nurse Edna asked. Was she happy? Jesus Christ, thought Homer Wells and said, 
Just tell Dr. Large that Melanie has the questionnaire. I thought he should know. Yes, yes. Nurse Edna shouted. But was she happy? I don't think so, Homer said. Oh, dear. I thought she was going to stay for supper, Wally said, serving the swordfish. I thought she wanted a job, Angel said. I don't think she needed the job, Homer said. She just wanted to look you over, Pop, Angel said, and Wally laughed. Angel had told Wally that Melanie had been Homer's girlfriend, which was very funny to Wally. After supper, he helped Candy with the dishes while Angel drove around the orchards with Pete Hyde. Wally liked the twilight by the swimming pool. From the kitchen window, Homer and Candy could see him sitting in the wheelchair. It's time to tell, Homer said to Candy. No, please, Candy said. It's time to tell everyone everything, said Homer Wells. There's no more waiting and seeing. She stood behind him and put her arms around his hips. She pressed her face between his shoulder blades, but he did not even turn to face her. He just kept scrubbing the broiler rack. We'll discuss it with you, any way you want to do it, Homer said. Whether you want to be with me, when I tell Angel, whether you want me to be with you, when you tell Wally. Any way you want it, it'll be okay, he said. She hugged him as hard as she could but he just kept scrubbing. She buried her face between his shoulder blades and bit him in the back. He had to turn toward her then, he had to push her away. You're going to make Angel hate me. Candy cried. Angel will never hate you, Homer said to her. To Angel, you've always been just what you are, a good mother. Wally will hate me. She cried miserably. You're always telling me that Wally knows, said Homer Wells. Wally loves you. And you don't love me, anymore, do you? Candy said, she started to cry, then she threw the serving tongs at Homer, then she clenched her fists against her thighs. She bit down so hard on her lower lip that it bled, when Homer tried to touch lightly her lip with a clean dish towel, she pushed him away. I love you, but we're becoming bad people, he said. She stamped her foot. We're not bad people. She cried. We're trying to do the right thing, we're trying not to hurt anybody. We're doing the wrong thing, said Homer Wells. It's time to do everything right. In a panic, Candy looked out the window. We'll talk later, she whispered to Homer. She grabbed an ice cube out of someone's drinking glass, she held the cube to her lower lip. I'll see you by the pool. We can't talk about this around the pool, he told her.
I'll meet you at the cider house, she said, she was looking everywhere for a Wally, wondering what door he'd come in, any second. That's not a good idea, to meet there, said Homer Wells. Just take a walk. She snapped at him. You'll walk there your way, I'll walk there my way, I'll meet you, she said. She ran into the bathroom before Homer heard Wally at the terrace door. That night when Homer put Angel to bed, Angel said, You know, you really don't have to put me to bed anymore. I don't do it because I have to, Homer said. I like to. You know what I think? Angel said. What's that? Asked Homer, who dreaded the answer. I think you should try having a girlfriend, Angel said cautiously. Homer laughed. Good night, I love you, Homer said. I love you. Good night, Pop, Angel said, but when Homer was almost out of the door, Angel asked him, What's the thing you love best? You, Homer told his son. I love you best. Next to me, said Angel Wells. Candy and Wally, Homer said. Next to them, Angel said. Well, Dr. Larch, and all of them, in St. Clouds, I guess, said Homer Wells. And what's the best thing you ever did? Angel asked his father. I got you, Homer said softly. Next best, Angel said well, I guess it was meeting Candy and Wally, Homer said. You mean, when you met them? Angel asked. I guess so, said Homer Wells. Next best, Angel insisted. I saved a woman's life, once, Homer said. Dr. Larch was away. The woman had convulsions. You told me, Angel said. Angel had never been especially interested that his father had become a highly qualified assistant to Dr. Larch. Homer had never told him about the abortions. What else? Angel asked his father. Nothing else, really. I'm no hero. I haven't done any best things, or even any one best thing, Homer said. That's okay, Pop, Angel said cheerfully. Good night. Good night, said Homer Wells. Downstairs, the bedroom door was closed and there was no light coming from the crack under the door. But someone had left a light on in the kitchen, and the outdoor light was still on. He went to the Apple Mart office to read the mail, with the light on in the office, Candy could know where he was. And if she'd already gone to the cider house, he could walk there from the office. The package from Street Clouds, arriving on the day of Melanie's visit, startled Homer. He was shocked to see the black leather doctor's bag with the gold initials on it, F.S. Dr. Stone, 
Homer said aloud, remembering how Larch had addressed him once. Candy had been waiting for him for a while, she was nervous. It was heartbreaking for him to see that she had made up one of the beds. She'd brought a candle from the house, and had lit it, although candles were against the rules. Recently, Homer had found it necessary to call attention to candles on the list. One of the pickers had started a small fire with a candle some years ago. Please don't smoke in bed, and no candles, please. He'd written. Candy was sitting on the bed, and she had brushed her hair. I'm sorry, he said softly to her. We've tried it, we've certainly tried, but it just doesn't work. Only the truth will work. Candy sat with her knees together and her hands in her lap, she was shivering. Do you really think Angel's old enough to know all this? She whispered. I think he's old enough, said Homer Wells. There's always so much to do during harvest, Candy said. We'll wait until them after the harvest, then, Homer said. We've waited fifteen years. I guess we can wait six weeks more. She stretched out on her back on the thin bed. He went to the bed and sat on the edge of it, and she put her hand on his knee. He covered her hand with his hand. Oh, Homer, she said, but he couldn't turn to look at her. She took his hand and pulled it under her dress and made him touch her. She wasn't wearing anything under the dress. He didn't pull his hand away. But he didn't allow his hand to be more than a dead raid presence against her. What do you imagine will happen? She asked him coolly, after she realized that his hand was dead. I can't imagine anything, he said. Wally will throw me out, Candy said quietly and without self-pity. He won't, Homer said. And if he did, I wouldn't, then you would be with me. That's why he won't. What will Angel do? Candy asked. He will do what he wants, Homer said. I imagine he'll be with you when he wants, and with me when he wants. This part was hard to say, and harder to imagine. He'll hate me, Candy said. He won't, said Homer Wells. She pushed his hand away from her, in another moment, her hand found his knee again and he held her hand lightly there. Where will you go? Candy asked him after a while. Will I have to go anywhere? He asked her. I imagine so, Candy said. Homer Wells was trying to imagine it all when he suddenly heard the car. Candy sat up and blew out the candle. They sat holding each other on the bed, listening to the car approach them. The heavy car stopped at the cider house wall. It's Wally. Candy whispered. 
Homer picked up the doctor's bag and felt his way into the dark kitchen, his hand groped for the light switch. He had not heard the car door open, but he suddenly heard low voices. Homer Wells turned on the light, which momentarily blinded him. He thought that he must be as lit up as a Christmas tree in the cider house door. And, he thought, wasn't it right that it had been the Cadillac that had rescued him from street clouds, and now here was the Cadillac, in a way, come to rescue him again? For here he was, with a well-worn doctor's bag in hand. At last prepared to tell the truth, ready, at last, to take his medicine. He held Dr. Large's bag tightly and peered into the darkness. Suddenly, it was clear to him, where he was going. He was only what he always was, an orphan who'd never been adopted. He had managed to steal some time away from the orphanage, but street clouds had the only legitimate claim to him. In his forties, a man should know where he belongs. All day Wilbur Large worked in Nurse Angela's office. He was reviewing and putting the finishing touches to the history of Fuzzy Stone. That good doctor, Larch was also writing the obituary of Homer Wells. The rigors of an agricultural life and a high cholesterol diet killed him. Dr. Stone, on the other hand, was not a typical orphan. After all, who among the orphans had ever dared to challenge Dr. Larch? Fuzzy attacked Dr. Large's beliefs about the abortions, and had such strong views on the subject that he repeatedly threatened to expose Dr. Large to the board. Now Fuzzy was fighting diarrhea among the dying children of Asia. Large had just read an article which said that diarrhea was the number one killer of kids in that part of the world. It had been an exhausting day for Larch, who had also written to the board of trustees. Mrs. Grogan and his nurses knew it. He made them all meet in Nurse Angela's office. He leaned on his overworked typewriter like on a podium. Now, he said, because the women were chatting. Now we're going to prevent them. Whom? Nurse Carolyn asked aggressively. And you? Dr. Larch said to Nurse Carolyn, pointing his finger at her. You're my top gun. You're the one who's going to pull the trigger. You have to fire the first shot. Mrs. Grogan feared that Dr. Larch had finally gone crazy. Nurse Carolyn just wanted the facts. Okay, Nurse Carolyn said. Let's begin at the beginning. Whom do I shoot? You should inform on all of us, Larch told her. I'll do no such thing. Nurse Carolyn said. Very patiently, he explained it to them. It was so simple, to him it was simple because he'd been thinking of it for years. It was not simple to the rest of them, and he had to take them very slowly through the steps toward their salvation. 
They must assume that Melanie would respond to the questionnaire. They must believe that her response would be negative because Melanie was angry. She was born angry, she will always be angry, and even if she means us no harm, one day she will be angry enough, about something, about anything, so that she will respond to the questionnaire. And she'll say what she knows. Larch added, because Melanie is no liar. So he wanted the board to hear that he was an abortionist from someone else first. It was the only way they might be saved. Nurse Carolyn was the logical betrayer, she was young, she was relatively new. She had struggled with her conscience for a short period of time, and she had decided that she could remain silent no longer. Mrs. Grogan and the older nurses had to accept the situation because the doctor's authority was absolute. Nurse Carolyn, however, had a challenging attitude toward the authority figures of this or of any society. And when a doctor was breaking the law, even if it was not a nurse's role to challenge him, it was her right and her moral obligation to inform on him. And you, Lart said, pointing to Nurse Angela, you will recommend Fuzzy Stone. That it's a great load off your conscience, that I have been caught, Larch told her. But what will happen to you, Wilbur, if we expose you? Nurse Edna asked and cried. I'm almost a hundred years old, Edna, he said softly. I suppose, I'll retire. You won't go away, will you? Mrs. Grogan asked him. I wouldn't get very far, if I tried, he said. He had been so convincing about Fuzzy Stone, he had presented them with such marvelous details, that Nurse Carolyn was the only one who saw the problem. What if Homer Wells won't come here and pretend to be Fuzzy Stone? She asked Dr. Larch. Homer belongs here, Nurse Angela said. But he doesn't believe in performing abortions, Nurse Carolyn reminded all the old people. When did you last talk to him about it? She asked Larch. I've talked to him recently, and he believes in your right to perform them, he even sent me here, to help you. And he believes that it should be legal. But he also says that he could never, personally, do it, to him, it's killing someone. That's how he sees it. That's what he says. He has near perfect procedure, Wilbur Large said tiredly. Homer Wells thinks it's killing someone, Nurse Carolyn repeated. Dr. Larch moved slowly in the small room. He handed Nurse Angela the letter to the board which he had written for her. He handed Nurse Carolyn her letter, too. Just sign them, he said. Read them over, if you want. You don't know that Melanie will expose you, Mrs. Grogan said to him. Does it really matter? Larch asked. Just look at me. 
Do I have a lot of time? They looked away. I don't want to leave it up to Melanie. Or to old age, he added. Or to ether, he admitted, which caused Nurse Edna to cover her face with her hands. I prefer to take my chances with Homer Wells. Nurse Angela and Nurse Carolyn signed the letters. Several examples of the correspondence between Wilbur Larch and Fuzzy Stone were also sent to the Board of Trustees. Nurse Angela included these in the envelope with her letter. The board could understand that all the nurses, and Mrs. Grogan, had discussed the matter together. Wilbur Larch did not need Ether to help him sleep, not that night. In the morning, Larch started writing a letter to Homer. This time the letter was written in Larch's most didactic voice. He told Homer everything. He didn't beg. Larch said that he was sure that Angel would accept his father's sacrifice. He'll value your need to be of use, Wilbur Larch wrote. Young people find risk-taking heroic, Larch continued. If abortions were legal, you could refuse. But as long as they're against the law, how can you refuse? How can you allow yourself a choice in the matter when there are so many women who haven't the freedom to make the choice themselves? The women have no choice. So how can you feel free to choose not to help people who are not free to get other help? You have to help them because you know how. Think about who's going to help them if you refuse. Wilbur Larch was really tired. Here is the trap, Dr. Larch wrote to Homer. And it's not my trap, I haven't trapped you. Because abortions are illegal. Women who need and want them have no choice in the matter, and you, because you know how to perform them, have no choice, either. If abortion was legal, a woman would have a choice, and so would you. You could feel free not to do it because someone else would. But now you're trapped. Women are trapped. Women are victims, and so are you. You are my work of art, Wilbur Larch told Homer Wells. Everything else has just been a job. I don't know if you've got a work of art in you, Larch concluded in his letter to Homer, but I know what your job is. And you know what it is, too. You're the doctor.